Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today I'm going to be reacting to even more of your amazing comments. So today's episode mostly focuses on comments regarding nuclear stuff, as I requested in the last episode. So here's the first one. I only have one radiological accident story, and luckily it didn't happen to me directly. I was working as a bench chemist at a very large company. One of the other chemists was using carbon-14 labeled acetyl chloride to label a compound. The reagent came in a sealed glass ampule containing about a gram of the acetyl chloride. His method of opening a glass ampule was to chill it way down and then touch the scored neck of the ampule with a hot glass stirring rod. The stress would cause the temp imbalance. The, the stress caused by the temp imbalance would snap the ampule open on the score mark. By the way, I've never heard of this method before or ever since, and that also goes for me personally. I've literally never heard of this before. He was wearing PPE safety specs, lab coat, latex gloves, and company-mandated steel-toed shoes. This time, instead of cleanly snapping the ampule open, the whole ampule disintegrated in his gloved hand. He knew he was in trouble immediately, of course, so he stripped off his gloves and lab coat and went down to the shower locker room down the hall. Did I mention this was a very large industrial chemical enterprise? There he showered off the, the radiation safety people came and scrubbed him down with borax soap. His clothes were bagged, and I assume they are in a hot landfill somewhere. Hot in this context just means like a radioactive landfill. Even though the dude was nominally protected by his gloves, some 14C acetyl chloride made it through into his hand, and then into him. He had to be monitored for a few weeks until his urine cooled off, and then he had to wear a cotton glove on the affected hand. This was during the heyday of Michael Jackson and his one glove, so he endured a lot of jokes about that. Eventually, all the 14C carbon washed off out of him, and as far as I know, he was none the worse for it. Good times. Yeah, this is one of those really scary things, because, you know, we work with some isotopes like carbon-13 or deuterium all the time, and those feel relatively safe. And we see carbon-14 in papers quite often, but... Clearly, there's a, a massive safety concern with this, and so it's it's good that you guys are uh, mentioning this in the comments so that we can educate more people. So I did, in fact, work at a cyclotron, which produced isotopes for medical imaging and radiotherapy. I worked in the life sciences division, where we handle liquid sources of radiation, radioactive ions dissolved in solvent. This makes it quite easy to get contaminated, so we had lots of training and measures in place to make sure the contamination wasn't able to spread. During training, we heard about a guy who got his hands contaminated, didn't wash them, and went to the bathroom. Essentially, he got a radioactive material on his member and had to be scrubbed clean by the safety team. This was enough to scare everyone into being pretty careful. Yeah, you know, um, I think there's some people in the Discord who might uh, learn the wrong thing from this, and the, the real safety lesson here is uh, don't get any contaminated material on any part of your body, especially more sensitive ones. When, I was a, when my grad student mentor was an undergrad, his grad student mentor synthesized an artificial amino acid that had a high nitrogen content. Now, when we say a high nitrogen content, this is just means that there's a lot of nitrogen relative to the amount of carbon or hydrogen or other atoms in the molecule. This just basically means it's going to potentially be explosive. He scraped the vial to get more yield. You know, you want to get every last bit off of your, uh, your vial, your flask, so you scrape it down. And it violently detonated, blew out the sash of the fume hood, which is just the glass that protects us, uh, that they were working in. And uh, and then the one six feet behind them also broke, I guess. My mentor had glass shards embedded in him. His mentor lost fingers. And so this is a really good thing to highlight. If you're trying to get quantitative recovery, instead of scraping stuff out of one vessel into another, oftentimes it's better to just dissolve it in a solvent and transfer that solution and then concentrate that down. Most of the time, you can do that even for reaction mixtures. You just dissolve, transfer to the vial that you're going to run the reaction in, and then concentrate that down. This especially applies if you have stuff that's uh, sensitive to scraping or, sh or uh, scratching. Some mistakes were made when I was trying to nitrate phenanthrolene. To those who don't know, phenanthrolene doesn't get nitrated easily, as like there's two pyridines in it, so it's already relatively deactivated. And you need to use concentrated nitric and sulfuric acids as uh, as possible and temperature around 180 degrees Celsius. I dissolved the starting material in sulfuric acid and was instructed to use an ice bath when adding more acid and to start increasing the temperature slowly. The result was that the mixture froze in the ice bath. I did the reaction in a three-necked flask and capped the extra necks with rubber septa. I did this because I've had issues with glass caps getting stuck in the necks. So uh, if you ever need a trick, what you do is you just get a little bit of sulfuric acid and you grease the joints with sulfuric acid, rather than just putting in the glass stoppers directly. I have no idea why I thought the septa would survive these conditions. They didn't. Yeah, nitrating conditions will completely destroy like most rubbers, like a lot. 
This reaction produces a lot of nitrogen dioxide. I managed to breathe in a nice amount when taking a TLC sample. If you've ever wondered how it feels to get a hot acidic gas in your lungs, I can tell you that it hurts a lot. Yeah, definitely if you've ever smelled uh, NO2, it's not a pleasant smell. Uh, it's very offensive. And if you have, you know, concentrated solutions of acid at high temperatures, it's definitely possible that you could get a lung full. So you definitely should work in a well-ventilated area. In my undergrad, my, my round bottom slipped off into the rotovap and spilled all of its contents into the water. I got my professor. Uh, he wasn't angry at me. He later told me that accidents happened and to not worry to dispose of the water. He took the bath out of the fume hood and pretty much carelessly dumped all of the water into a container and quite a bit of it spilled onto the floor. Turns out that there was a lacrimator that had spilled into the water bath and now it was all over the lab. Everyone's eyes started getting teary. The lab was shut down for the rest of the week and I still take full responsibility for that incident to this day. So yeah, a lot of the time you might be working with benzyl bromide, allyl bromide, something like that, bromocytophenone, chlorocytophenone, and you're just working with it casually as like an alkylating agent. You might be like a little bit worried that they're carcinogenic, but they can also be like intense lacrimators. And if you are like rotovapping stuff with them in there, you just need to be careful because it could be really bad. You're essentially just macing yourself in the lab. My prof told us about a story uh, about an acidic water mixing accident that he had as an undergrad. He was trying to scrub something with chromic acid. If you're not sure why you'd be uh, using chromic acid, I'll include a link here to my most recent video where I talk about cleaning solutions, and uh, chromic acid is one of them. He added water and the stuff violently boiled and shot out of the container, pretty much soaking him. Thank God he didn't get seriously hurt. Then he immediately threw water on himself and got rid of all of his clothes, leading to him running around naked and a uh, torpedo torpedified, <laughs> searching for the next toilet, where he spent about 40 minutes until someone came in and he could tell the guy to get his lab TA. TLDR, our professor almost killed himself with chromic acid and ran around naked in the lab building. So, you know, you might be uh, reluctant to strip down and get all the chemicals off yourself, but as we said last time, it's definitely worth sacrificing your pride so that you get to survive to do chemistry another day. And it might be uncomfortable, but it's more uncomfortable than dying. Man, some of these stories terrify me. The biggest mistake I ever made in a lab was washing out a viscometer cylinder over a waste funnel with acetone and accidentally shooting some acetone back into my face, promptly getting a few drops on my eyes since I was being impatient and not wearing safety glasses due to masks fogging them up. So yeah, this is a big controversial thing in my lab. Uh, a lot of people said you could put a dilute soap solution on the goggles and then that would prevent them from fogging up. But what I found when you do that is instead the lab goggles are just always foggy because there's a detergent solution on them. Uh, if you find that the detergent solutions worked in your lab, let me know down below. My eyes hurt for a solid 24 hours after that, and it has become my learning incident on why you always, always, always wear safety glasses. If that was toluene, I wouldn't have been able to see. Yeah, I've had close calls as well where I've got chemical residue right on my lab glasses, and I have been very grateful that I've been wearing lab glasses in those instances. There's a reason why we have a lot of the practices that we do. Once in a lab, a student tried to make a borate proof reaction with methanol on a tripod, and the beaker with a bunch of methanol stood directly near that. So he tried to light it on fire with a flint and steel, and the whole beaker burned too. So he grabbed it with his bare hands and poured it down the drain, but the whole sink began to burn. He also had burned some, uh, he'd also had some small burns on his hand. So essentially what they're doing here is combining methanol with boric acid, and that makes trimethyl borate, which is extremely flammable. And sometimes people do that to get the effect of a green flame. Uh, a friend of mine, I used to work, uh, Okay, I'm just going to skip over this. Houston Industry used Methylmercaptan as part of their emergency alert system. When there was a situation that required everyone to report into the, the, refu the refugee chambers underground. So basically, like, if crap hits the fan in their mind, they, they have to go to this special room, is what they're saying. A 10-liter bottle of this stuff was dumped into the fresh air supply for the mine. I felt sorry for the person who had to release it. So rather than trying to send out some sort of alert system via their phone or something else, what they would literally do here is they'd just break a giant bottle of methyl mercaptan and everybody would smell it and they'd be like, oh no, we have to get to safety, which is kind of a clever solution that I, I haven't heard before. If you're familiar with this sort of thing and you got more stories, I'd love to hear them down below. I worked in the synchrotron. A contractor was installing some new equipment and thought the tamper-proof screws on the beamline radiation shielding were some sort of funky rivets, so he just drilled them out. Removing the panel like that tripped a safety interlock that initiated an immediate beam dump, ruining all active experiments and causing massive schedule chaos as it takes a long time to get the beam up to its full operating power. Around the same time, someone got trapped inside the cyclotron down the road. They were all almost exposed to high vacuum. 
the Department of Energy mandated a fresh round of safety training for the entire facility. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot of headaches here. And uh, from, from the stories I've heard about radiochemistry, it's made me definitely reluctant to pursue it. Although uh, when you do get good results, it's definitely rewarding. Back when I worked on bio-based paints, I was doing a workup on some natural blue tetraparoles dissolved in water. It had taken weeks to extract and purify half a gram from the bacteria that produced it. We had a crappy rotovap, so I decided to evaporate the last few milliliters of water by hand under mild nitrogen flow. Unfortunately, someone had turned up the flow regulator all the way, and I forgot to check it. And had to and to make matters worse, I opened the fume hood window quite far because it's just water and non-toxic paint, right? So a split second after I opened the nitrogen line, the entire fume hood got an involuntary paint job, and I looked like a depressed Smurf, complimenting, uh, contemplating his life choices. Yeah, I've had a similar incident where a researcher in my lab was extracting saponins, and he ended up spilling his uh, precious, precious saponins into the fume hood, and what ended up happening is these saponins came from soap berries, and so the, the fume hood got a good, nice, clean, uh, clean surface. Didn't happen to me personally, but at my last workplace, we used to make uh, perming lotions in batches of two tons at a time that involved handling multiple dozens of kilograms of ammonia and thioglycolic acid. Not only would it stink the whole building out, the plant operators had to wear full face gas masks to do it safely. On one infamous occasion, both operators had put the wrong filter in their masks, particles rather than gases. So basically like gas masks aren't just like a bulletproof thing that can tolerate anything. Some are good for particles, some are uh, good for certain types of gases. So it's always important if you're using a gas mask to check that it will protect you from the hazards that you're currently working with. And both came down with migraines and severe nosebleeds. So uh, that's terrifying. Uh, I hope I never have to experience anything like that. And if you don't want to experience that either, make sure you look at the safety protocol for your gas masks if you ever have to wear one. I work in a physics research lab where we use tritium gas on a regular basis. This is definitely my favorite story of the entire episode. We were recently on the receiving end of a big mess up where one of our contractors sent us a pressure vessel with glass capsules in it that was supposed to be filled with deuterium. Well, it turns out they filled the vessel through a line that was full of tritium and severely contaminated it without noticing. Luckily, we opened it in a room with a tritium monitor, which instantly went nuts upon opening. Everyone then sprinted out of the room with panicked looks, and we spent like $100,000 on decontamination, bioassays for everyone, and replacing a bunch of equipment that couldn't be decontaminated. Luckily, no one ended up receiving a significant dose of radiation or breathed in a meaningful amount of tritium gas, but it was a disaster. That sounds absolutely terrible. Terrifying. I have some of those glow-in-the-dark tritium vials, but man, I cannot imagine what would happen if you had a possible tritium leak, especially in an entire expensive operating lab with a lot of people. That's completely terrifying to me. LOL, I can imagine. A former PhD in my lab wanted to pick up a vial at the end of her bench. I warned her to be careful as I had samples in there which took me weeks to synthesize and purify. Her reply, ah, hush, I'll manage. She flipped over two of my most costly products in round-bottom flasks. I think she didn't dare to look me in the eyes for quite a few weeks. Yeah, this is one of the things that definitely happens in research labs. Oftentimes you can accidentally have a mistake that causes you to uh, ruin something for one of your lab mates. And if you're a good lab mate, you'll make it up to them as much as possible. If that doesn't mean remaking their stuff, it usually at least means buying them a round of beers. I once had to make chlorine at, at a site for a reaction since we don't have chlorine cylinders, but I needed it fairly cold. So rather than going the manganese dioxide route, that is the oxidation of hydrochloric acid with manganese dioxide, I decided I would just mix some bleach and hydrochloric acid. So I set up a three neck round bottom flask with large quantity of sodium hypochlorite placed in the flask already. I decided to vacuum grease all the joints and place those green grips on all stoppers. The green grips that they're talking about are Keck clips, which are useful for keeping uh, glassware connected together. I added some hydrochloric acid in a dropping funnel and drip, 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 some chlorine started forming. The chlorine was taped, uh, tapped to another flask and so that reaction was happening as well. Suddenly the senior 58 year old chemist I worked with decided that the rate of chlorine production was too low and just decided to dump a lot of HCl in the system. If you remember the last episode, you'll know why this is a bad idea. He emptied the funnel, but it but it's made badly, so it was a still consistent drip, basically like the hole in the stopcock was too slow. The rate still wasn't fast enough for him, so he shook the flask violently, and that's where it went wrong. So much chlorine was formed at once that the middle stopper shot up and cracked the purging bend for chlorine before breaking itself. The lab was filled with chlorine, too, because we were working out of the fume hood, and it was too small for the scale of the reaction we were doing. He decided to go out, so I cleaned it all up, and the chlorine left 
just the worst irritation in the back of my throat for like three weeks. Yeah, chlorine is awful, and you should always be working with chlorine in a very, very well ventilated area. Someone told me to upload this orange stir bar that I got after stirring carrots and acetone for at 35 degrees Celsius for a week. So here you go. It didn't really want to come off. Most of the time, we think of stains coming from uh, specific reactions, but in this case, this person was testing out the carrot reduction chemistry, and you can see, while it may or may not have reduced their ketones, it definitely did not reduce the amount of color in their stir bar. As a 28-year retired PhD chemical engineer, diamond synthesis, I can say that perpetual failure is what a research and development career is all about. That's why we get the big bucks. My father told me the worse the job, the more it pays. We accept near imperceptible progress, toil, always knowing it won't work, swallowing crush crushing frustration, and the concomitant management asimony. I had four things that worked in my career. That's all. Four. Fewer than some, more than others. There's a giant science machine at work, and we're a part of it. One of my advisors said, you must celebrate when something works, because in a long science career, not much will work. And he was right. He definitely is right. He also said the biggest skill as a PhD candidate is an awareness of and humility to understand the sheer mass of knowledge that you don't have and never will have. But your colleagues may. It's true. There's a lot to know, right? Like, there's, there's too much to know, almost. Indeed, the less intelligent you are, the more you think you know. This has proven true many times in my career. A PhD doesn't mean you're smart, it means you understand how little you personally know. And especially in the Discord, I've experienced that, wow, there, there's a lot of people who have t a ton of expertise in things that I know absolutely nothing about, and uh, it's quite humbling. During my training, I worked with a lot of diethyl ether and pentane, since we were mostly working at minus 80 degrees Celsius. I did a lot of ether pentane columns as well, and let me tell you, they suck, especially in the summer. What it, what's air conditioning anyway? Ever did an ether pentane column at 30 degrees room temp? The only good thing that was, was that my supervisor realized really quickly that this didn't work, so they so I could go home early over that summer. Great solvents. S tier for allowing me to enjoy the nice summer days. Yeah, going home early on in the summer, definitely S tier. A grad student purchased 10 millicuries of Californium 252, and they put it they put it left in a coworker's desk drawer without telling anyone, then they left for another job. To show how serious this is, we now keep it at two millicuries in a 55-gallon drum filled with neutron absorber off-site where no one is within 30 yards of it. Yeah, this is absolutely terrifying. This is another reason why I would be totally terrified to work anywhere near nuclear stuff. I remember I heard of a dude who at his house, in an amateur setting, filled a regular glass flask with chlorine gas and pumped hydrogen into it. So obviously he was trying to make HCl gas. It exploded and he landed at the emergency room with a piece of glass in his neck and stomach. Yikes. Do not try mixing chlorine and hydrogen at home. Probably don't mix uh, anything with chlorine at home. Probably the only chlorine you should be using at home is bleach. Okay, and so last but not least, I have the Yikes Awardees. So these go to the most cursed comments that are not so cursed that I can't include them on the channel, but are still so cursed that just absolutely yikes. I unironically like working with teratogens. It makes being infertile a bonus, lol. Just because you want to be infertile today doesn't mean you'll want to be uh, still infertile some other day, so it's definitely to play the long game here. We made dibenzyl acetone in an organic chemistry lab way back when. It smelled really nice, so I ate a small amount of the powder. It was really delicious. I took the rest home to season my dinner. Yikes. One time, a chemist dropped a liter glass bottle of, if I recall correctly, perolidinone. The whole building smelled like, I don't know how to phrase this politely, it smelled like baby batter for a whole week. Could you make a video about how to manage a hypothetical, inefficial, on-property waste disposal site, aka a chem pit? Uh, <laughs> preferably the owner of such a chem pit wouldn't like to have the authorities notice funky stuff in the groundwater and still be able to grow carrots in his garden. And I think uh, this person, Zocker Twin, said it best. There are three options. One, don't get into such a mess in the first place. Dispose of your chemicals properly. Two, get a qualified contractor to properly, properly clean it up because you didn't follow advice, number one. Number three, cover it up. Move to another place and live with the thought in your head that some innocent children might dig it up and ingest the stuff at any time. So, you know, definitely, definitely do not have a chem pit. That is a terrible, terrible idea. So with that, I hope you've enjoyed this video. It would really help out the channel if you left a like and subscribe, and I hope you have a great day.